The very core of the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul says that when he first entered into places, that's what he preached according to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And he said, not only did I preach it, he said, I preached it according to the Scripture. As far as we know, ever since the church has begun, on the first day of the week, they have come together to partake of the Lord's Supper. The very core of the Lord's Supper is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Although we come together every first day of the week to observe this, it's not every first day of the week that this is also the theme of our study for the day. But today it is. And so as we think about partaking of this supper, I would like for you to think about where did this originate? I'd like for you to think about, is this something that a group of people sat down and, and they gave some thought and said, you know what, we don't want to forget. Think about how wonderful it is that Jesus died for us and, and we don't want to forget that, but it wasn't us who sat down and said, this is a supper that we want to come up with and, and we want to practice this. It was the Lord. And when Paul was speaking to the people at Corinth, he told those individuals, and I'd like to just quickly read. We won't have a slide, but I'd like to quickly read for you 23. And by the way, in the scripture reading a few minutes, you'll hear this again and you'll see it again. But Paul didn't say, hey, this is a great idea I've come up with. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 11 and 23. He says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was portrayed took bread and he gave thanks, and then he gives further instructions about the Lord's Supper. But notice the emphasis Paul places upon this supper. He says, listen, I received this vision from the Lord. He's the one that taught me, because remember, Paul was an apostle out of season. He wasn't there the night of the Passover being celebrated. And this was so important that when Jesus later was instructing Paul of things that he needed to catch up on, this was one of the things that Paul needed to catch up on. And he said, let me tell you where this, this supper instituted. Let me show you how it came about. It was the night that I was celebrating the Passover. It was the same night that I was portrayed. And here's what we did. This morning, we participate in something that literally was began, taught, instructed, commanded by Jesus Christ himself. It's his supper. The second thing that we see by interest are the various names or descriptions given to this. We will not look at all of them, but just for this brief moment, I'd like for you to think about that term, the Lord's Supper. That's what it he calls it in the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 11. In 1 Corinthians 10, in verse 16, this supper is called communion. The word communion is also the same in the Greek that we translate fellowship. In other words, we come together to commune. The family of God comes around the table to share in this meal together that has a focus upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that very same 1 Corinthians 10, later on in verse 21, he calls this supper, he calls it the Lord's table. We gather around a table. But we also see the ingredients. It's Jesus who picked up the unleavened bread of, of the Passover feast and he says, as he breaks it, I want you to think of my body. He also picks up the cup that would have been the fruit of the vine and he says, I want you to think of my blood. And that brings us to the symbolism of this. When he said, I want you to think of my body, he, just, he didn't stop there. He said, I want you to think about my body that was broken for you. Incarnation. God became flesh, 1 John 1 and 14, and dwelt among us, but he also sacrificed his life for us. When we think about the body of Jesus, think about the sacrifice that he died in our place. He was a perfect sacrifice and we're flawed. He was the substitute for us. But then even when he talks about the blood, Notice it was blood that brings us salvation, but it's also blood that brings us a covenant. And we'll look at that a little bit later on in our lesson. But I'd like for you to also see the purpose. The purpose is real clear. By the way, if you're a guest here this morning and, and you've never seen the Lord's Supper observed, it will probably seem strange to you to call something as simple as bread and, and grape juice, to call it supper. And here we are in the morning and call it supper and then to call it the Lord's Supper. And it would be natural for anyone who doesn't understand to say, 
Why? What is the purpose of all of this? And Jesus clearly taught each time as he took the bread and then as he took the cup, each time he taught, do this in remembrance of me. It's something we do, do this. It's something we do and we do it in remembrance. It is a memorial of who or what? It is a memorial of Christ. His life on this earth, the, the body, but his death, that broken body, his death, the shedding of blood. But that, yet that covenant that we did not make with someone who is dead, it is a covenant that is made with someone who is alive. So therefore he's resurrected. You see, the Lord's Supper carries with it the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And the purpose is that we will never forget. It's perpetuated every week throughout the Christian family until Jesus comes again, we will never forget. I don't know if your family's like this at all. I understand that some would say, oh, we don't ever do that. But let me tell you what goes on in our family sometime. Our family, sometime when we gather for supper, sometime the food is on the stove instead of on a table. And sometime we go to the, the den or the living room and we eat and we watch TV. I'm not saying that's healthy. I'm just saying we do that sometime. And so sometime when, when, when we're dishing up our plates, the first one or two through the line speaks up and says, are we going to the living room or are we going to the table? And usually it's Tracy that speaks up and she says, oh, no, no, we're going to eat together tonight. Set at the table. But think about how that starts. We're going to eat together. Well, we're together in the living room. But even though we're in the same room, we're not sharing with each other. All the focus is on the TV. But when you sit around the table, the focus is on relationships. Isn't it interesting that God's term is, I want to invite you this morning to my son's table. I want to invite you to a communion, sharing with, you're not coming alone, you're coming with God's family. And you're coming to a table to share in relationships. Relationship with God, relationship with His Son and Spirit, relationship with all of God's people. Can you imagine when John the Baptist looked near the beginning of, of Jesus' public ministry and he saw Jesus coming and he said to him, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Can you imagine that he had no idea the fullness of his statement there? They understood as being Jews how significant the Passover was to Israel how God delivered Israel from Egyptian slavery and gave them a home and gave them freedom. And how also in the shedding of the blood of a lamb and eating of that lamb, they also had death spared from their firstborn. And so once a year they would celebrate this Passover feast. Once a year a lamb would be slaughtered. They would eat the flesh of that lamb. The blood was significant that was put on the doorpost back in Egypt. And Jesus Christ, he would celebrate the last time that Passover was celebrated before his death. And during that Passover supper, he would pick up some of that unleavened bread. And as we just had so capably read for us, he would break that bread and he would inform them, I'm going to give you a new supper. I'm going to give you a new feast. And in this feast, I want you to remember me. First, it's a memorial. It's to take our minds, our lives, and our appreciation back to our core of who we are. It's so easy in the world to forget who we are. It's so easy at work to get distracted and think that maybe we're more like the world and we're not as God's children. It's so easy to get out in our communities and think that things in the community are, are more important and they're not more important. And this supper is to call us back. 
It's to take us back in our mind's eye, but not just in remembrance, but it's to take us back in our conviction. Who are we? We are sons and daughters of God. We are brothers and sisters of an elder brother who died for us. We find our identity, we find our hope in Jesus Christ. And when we eat of that unleavened bread, we remember the incarnation that God became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1 and 14. We remember the fact that he was willing to give his life. No man takes my life, but I give it, John the 10th chapter. But we also drink this cup. Did you notice that in the text that was read, he doesn't just say this blood is so that you can remember that I forgive you of your sins, although that's important to remember. But notice again, if you have your Bible there, I'd like for you to see there in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. Notice what he says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four 24 is what we just spoke about, about the bread and the body. And look in 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. What's the cup? A new covenant in my blood. When we go back to Exodus, the 24th chapter, this is just after the giving of the Ten Commandments is recorded. And then there are several chapters of other laws that God gave. You know, sometimes we mistakenly think that all God did under the old law was just give Ten Commandments and that was it. No, there was a whole other book that God gave that Moses had to write. And so Moses comes off of the mountain and he, he delivers the Ten Commandments and he reads all of this that in Exodus 24 is called the Book of Covenants. And I'd like for you to notice here in the 24th chapter, notice the blood of this covenant here in, in 24 verse 7 and 8. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read in the hearing of the people and they said all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. You see what's just happened? God has given his part of the covenant and now he's asking the people will you keep your part of the covenant? You know that's what a covenant is. It's agreement between two. Are you going to do your part? I've done my part. I'm doing my part. And now he's saying to the people, will you do your part? And will you continue to do your part? Well, how are we going to ratify this? Notice the very next verse. Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. It was the blood that ratified the covenant, that sealed it, where everybody said, it's paid for. We agree with this. Jesus Christ came to this earth, not only to bring the forgiveness of sins, but to bring a covenant where Jesus has done his part of how to live and teach us how to live. He came to this earth and he lived a righteous life. And now he asked us, be holy as I'm holy. He asked us, crucify the old man of sin. I was crucified with your sin. Now crucify the old man of sin. Romans the sixth chapter. Pass through the waters of cleansing and live in newness of life. Do you remember in 1 Peter, out of all the ways we could describe the work of the Godhead and then also describe us as an elect people. You realize that God has chosen us. And he mentions all three members of the Godhead, the Trinity in 1 Peter, the first chapter in verse, set, in verse two. And he in this tells how each member of the Godhead had a work in the election, in choosing us. And I'd like for you to notice especially what he says in the third about Jesus Christ. But we're picking up in 1 Peter 1 and verse two. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Who are you? You and I are blood-bought people that serve a covenant that has been blood-bought, given by the giver of this covenant, Jesus Christ, and it was his blood that bought this covenant. And now the, the, the Peter writes and he says, if you're elect of God, if you're elect of Christ, if you're elect of the Holy Spirit, you've been sprinkled. You see, it's going back to that symbolism under the old covenant. You've been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. Jesus, we're listening to you. You want us to come together and you want us to partake of this supper. What do you want us to think about whenever we partake of the fruit of the vine. And he says, I want you to think about my covenant. My covenant that is 
my blood. Looking back, we remember the body and the blood. But I'd like for you to also notice that we also see something that is done at the present time that is a proclamation. Look at 1 Corinthians 11 and 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That word proclaim is, is a very uh, clear and strong word, even in the original language. As a matter of fact, that word is translated most often in the New Testament as preach, sometimes teach. Another time or two, it's translated to show. In other words, when we come together as a church, individually and collectively, what we're doing is we are showing the Lord's death. You're demonstrating that you believe that Jesus lived and that he died. You are preaching that message. You know, we sing, we sing songs like, I believe in Jesus. And in the chorus, all three, cor all three verses mention various things about Jesus healing the blind or raising Lazarus from the dead or stilling the storm at Galilee. And then each line of the verses ends with saying that something that Jesus does for me, like he's the answer for me, or verse two, he's made a difference in me, or verse three, he's coming again. And then each time it moves into the proclamation where we all sing together. Yes, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. I believe that the tomb was found empty. And I believe that he is the answer for me. When we sing that, it is easy for us to understand we are making a proclamation of Jesus. I'm making a statement. I believe in the one that died on Calvary. I believe that he's coming again. That's who I am. That's how I live. He's my life. He's my compass. Do you realize that when we take of the Lord's Supper, listen, I'm not talking about by, by us if we stretch an application. I'm talking literally from inspired writing. Paul says, you are preaching your belief in the death of Jesus. But also, it's in that very same verse that he says, you're looking forward in anticipation. Notice again this same verse on the next slide, but notice here we've underlined the next phrase. You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We believe that the one who is dead is resurrected and they ascended into heaven and we believe what the angel said, that he's coming again. And so we will do this for how long? How long are you going to have this gathering of God's family? How long are you going to participate in the memorial? Do you remember the hundreds and hundreds of signs that were flown after 9-11? Do you remember the weeks and the months that followed? You could go not just in New York City, you could go all over the United States and you could find signs everywhere that said what? We will not forget. The Lord's Supper is a way that ties us to the fact of our past. We will not forget all that Jesus has done. It ties us to our present. We will proclaim it today, but it also ties us in anticipation. He's coming again. And just as we've gathered to eat this supper Sunday after Sunday on this earth and the wonderful blessing that that is, think of the blessing it's going to be to eat around the heavenly table. To have Jesus leading that supper in person. And we eat this supper in remembrance until he comes again. The past, the present, and the future all comes together in the one supper. It's around the Lord's table. It's communion. Tonight we'll come back and we'll look at the broader text of 1 Corinthians 11 to see how not to take the communion. But tonight... 
And this morning, I hope the study will move all of us to a deeper appreciation and to a more careful observance of the wonderful supper that we're invited to. But even in that, it's not simply a ceremony that's hollow. It matters who we are. We're invited as God's children. It's not just anybody come. And it's not go live like a heathen through the week and then act righteous as you're eating the bread. The Lord is looking for true, genuine, authentic worshipers. It always amazes me the number of people that debate whether or not they ought to take the Lord's Supper. Listen, that's not a debate. What you need to do is repent and move close to God and take the Lord's Supper. This morning, let's not leave here turning our back on the one who has done more for us in the past and in the present and the future than what we could ever imagine. God is good. All the time, God is good. But it's around this supper that we just can't miss the point. Is it possible to worship in a way that God would say, not only should you have not done it, you've done it, and you're worse off than before you came? Can you imagine that? Lord meets you in the parking lot. Where you been to worship? And he says, whoa, you're a worse person for having gone to that worship service. What would that worship service be like? Where an inspired writer writes and he says these words, 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, verse 17. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. Since you come together, see that's the assembly. That's talking about when the church comes together. You come together not for the better, but for the worse. What were they doing wrong? Well, he listed. First of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. And then he discusses these divisions. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you, in other words, that's describing cliques. And 20, therefore, when you come together in one place, that's talking about the assembly again, the problem is it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. But notice in 21, they're eating something. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? With an exclamation mark. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do, second choice, or do you despise the church of God? Or third choice, do you shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Obviously, this paragraph opens and closes with the same message. You guys are going into a worship service. I can't praise you at all for what you're doing. What's the problem, Paul? The problem is you're participating in something that you're coming out of it a worse person than when you have gone. Well, what's the problem, Paul? He says the problem is the church is to be a place where you are united and where in your unity you build each other up. Instead, you have become a church that is divided. And in your division, you have practiced selfishness and indulgence. And so what is implied here is that those who are wealthy and those that have means are gathering at a time earlier and not telling the ones who are in poverty when they're gathering and each is bringing their own food. But the problem is those in poverty don't have much to bring. And so when they come, they leave their hungry and the rich leave their full not sharing with those who do not have, and even to the point of drunkenness, which obviously in the scriptures is condemned. And so Paul looks at all of this division 
and these factions that have formed, these cliques that have formed. And then he even finally in this paragraph addresses the fact, I can't praise you because you're not even participating in the Lord's Supper anymore. Now you can imagine some of them might have tried to rebuttal that by saying, wait a minute, we are. We, we come together and we eat a supper regularly. Listen, just because we call something by a biblical name doesn't make it what the Bible teaches. And so they had practiced. They had to practice what some would call agape type feast where they'd come together and they'd eat meals together. And there are a lot of people that try to take culture and say, well, it was a part of their culture. And if you just understood the culture, you could really understand what's happening here. It is good when we can know backgrounds on text and when we can know culture and things like that. But listen, brethren, a study of the background or a culture of a text can never change the teaching of the text or we have done the wrong thing. If there was something about the culture that I must understand to be able to understand this passage, God would have revealed it in this passage. What is the simple teaching? The simple teaching is they had perverted God's message by participating in meals that were not scriptural. And Paul looks at it and says, I can't find anything to praise you about the way you have stopped taking the Lord's Supper and you have put in its place this participation in some kind of, see, we can't even call it a fellowship meal. You know what the word fellowship, we talked about this morning. Fellowship comes from the word, it, it literally means to share. They weren't participating in a fellowship meal. They were participating in cliques eating meals together. And isn't it interesting, as we studied this morning, another word for the Lord's Supper that God gives us in his scriptures is communion. They weren't even practicing communion. How serious is division and what's the answer to division? Drop back just a few pages. I'd like for you to see how the book of 1 Corinthians opens. In 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, we see in the first few chapters, again, the plea to get rid of divisions and to promote unity. And I believe in 1 Corinthians 1 and 10, if we were going to pick out just a real short passage to say, what is it that we can learn about unity? This would be a great little short passage. Look what his plea was in 1 Corinthians 1 and 10. Now, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice five different ways he speaks of unity in these following uh, phrases. That you all speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together. We're counting that as one, even though it's kind of three in one. In the same mind and in the same judgment. Can you read that verse and walk away from anything other than the fact of unity is very important to God. And if we are God's people, unity ought to be very important to us. But it's not unity based on the sacrifice of the truth. It's unity based upon standing on Jesus Christ. Notice he says, I want you to be unified with the same mind and the same judgment. The mind has to be not your mind and not my mind. We're unified on the mind of Jesus Christ. So we stand on the doctrines of Jesus Christ. We unify on anything that Christ teaches. In just a moment, we're going to see in our text how that was the answer to their problem. But we unify upon the mind of Christ. Now what about the things that Christ doesn't speak upon? Then we have unity of judgment. What is the organization of the Lord's church? The organization of the Lord's church is to have elders that we are commanded to obey them. Now have you ever heard someone say, but I thought we're to obey Christ. We are to obey Christ, but what about in the areas of judgment where Christ is not spoken? How are we gonna be unified? We obey the elders. And so when you have a congregation of people that they have the same mind of Christ and in any areas of judgment, they follow the judgment calls, if you will, of our elders, that's how you have a unified group of people. They can speak the th same thing. They can be perfectly joined together. They're going to practice love because they learn that by standing on the mind of Christ. 
So we come back to our text here that there is a tremendous problem presented. What is the answer going to be? Isn't it interesting that even though he could have continued to pull back the layers of the onion to this problem, and he could have discussed this problem inside and out, that's not what he does. Instead, he reveals, identifies the problem, and then immediately starts talking about the solution. Let me talk to you for just a moment as husbands and wives. What we tend to do a real good job of in our relationships and poor communication is we can spend minutes upon half hours upon hours talking about the problem and we won't spend five minutes talking about a solution and then we wonder why we can't get along and why we can't find resolution. We usually talk so much about the problem because we want to pile on the other person and just show how guilty and how wrong they are. What if instead we could say, Let's identify what the problem is. And once we're clear that we have both identified the problem, let's spend the next amount of time simply talking about a solution. Paul here has pulled back a layer of the onion. He really didn't have to pull back a layer. It's obvious. He's looking at the church of Corinth. He's looking at how they have perverted the Lord's Supper. And he says, you got serious problems here. I can't praise you in any of this. You ought to be coming together to participate in a communion and you're not participating in communion. Instead, you see cliques. Instead, you see indulgences that are are sinful and selfishness that, of course, is sinful. Oh, we better talk about this problem a long time. Paul says, we don't have to talk about this problem a long time. We can solve this problem just like this. Wow, Paul, you're telling me a serious church problem like that and you can solve it that easily? I'm not saying it's easy because anytime we have sacrificed self-will, It's not easy to sacrifice self-will, but the solution is this easy. Look at 23. We're not going to develop this because we developed this this morning. But I just want you to notice, we stopped with him saying, this is the problem. And the very next verse is the answer. Look at 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Wow. That's genius. There's a problem in the way we're doing things. Once we identify there's a problem, instead of just trying to spray paint a rusted piece of metal, instead of trying to put a bell and a horn and a whistle on the handlebars, if the bicycle is wrong, let's not modify the wrong bicycle. If the bicycle is wrong, let's throw the bicycle out and say, you know what we have to do? We've got to go back to what Jesus said originally. Let's go back to what Jesus said and let's start again. So he says to the brethren at Corinth, here's the solution. Go back to what Jesus taught us. This is the manner. This is the pattern. This is the procedure. This is what he did and would have us to do. You know, There are many things that I admire about Martin Luther's conviction to stand against what he perceived to be false doctrine. But you know, the simple principle of where he fell so short was that when he identified things in the denomination that he was a part of that was wrong, instead of going back to the scriptures and saying, let's start back at Acts 2 and let's start all over And let's figure out how to take the seed, the word of God, and let that grow. Instead, he just changed some bells and whistles. And the result was another denomination. Paul could have come in and he could have said, 
Okay, we've got this supper that's really gotten out of hand. It's really several suppers, the rich people's supper, the poor people's supper, which isn't really much. And, and we've got a lot of clicks. So what could we move around here to maybe get this click to start moving better with this click? And you know what? I tell you what, let's set a law that from now on, everybody has to bring their food by 915 on Sunday morning. And he could have made all kind of rules and all kind of legislation that says, we're going to take this thing that's completely wrong and we're going to try to, 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 to regulate it into some form of righteousness. How do you become a Christian? You know that part where he says in Romans 6, I want you to crucify the old man of sin? He says, I want you to take that old person and I want you to modify it. I don't want you to try to scrub on it a little bit and put some bells and whistles on it. I want you to put that person to death. And I want you to find the newness of life that comes through transformation, like the caterpillar becoming the butterfly. I want you to move from the world to a life in Christ. Lord, what do you want us to be as a church? And he says, as a church... I want you to continually in your practice to go back to what I have given you. Lord, how do you want me to worship? I want you to go back to what I have given you. Lord, what if we get off course? We're human and we're pretty good at getting off course. I don't want you to modify your off course. I want you to scrap it and I want you to come back to what I have given you. And so over the next few verses, he deals with the manner The first paragraph we talked about, he revealed you've got a bad manner that you're practicing. You've got a pattern, you've got a procedure here, and it's full of flaws. We're going to go back to the manner that Jesus gave. You saw that word was right there in the text. This is the manner that he took the bread. This is the manner that he took the cup. And so now he's going to give us one more paragraph, and we've got to close with this. But notice, he gives us this next paragraph to say, you better examine yourself. And you better see if what you are doing isn't what Christ has given us to do. Notice how he says it here in 27. We'll just make some comments as we read along here and we'll close. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. You know, there's a lot of debate about, am I worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper? No, nobody's worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. It's only by the grace of God that we would have worthiness. But notice, if we'll just read the text, what it says, he's talking about a worthy manner. Or have you partaken in a worthy manner? And then not only notice the words, notice the whole context. How, what did the first paragraph talk about that, that we studied tonight? Their manner was all wrong. The way they were doing it, he said, I can't even see as the Lord's Supper. What's the answer? Here's the manner Jesus Christ gave us. We do it like this. And so now he's saying, examine yourself and see, are you taking it more like this manner in the future? Or are you going to take it more like this manner in the future? Are you going to take it in an unworthy manner? Or are you going to take it in a worthy manner? It's the choice of whether or not you follow the teachings of Jesus Christ or you don't. And so he says in in 28, we've got to examine ourselves. Let a man examine himself and so let him eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. How serious is this judgment? For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that he may not be condemned with the world. I'd like for you to notice again, verse 30. Because of this reason, what? What's the reason? people would stop partaking the Lord's Supper in the way that the Lord had taught them to take it. How serious is it to not worship in the way the Lord has taught us to worship? Paul says, right now in Corinth, there's some who are weak spiritually, there's others that are sick spiritually, and there's some that have died spiritually. Now friends, I don't write the text. I just preach it. I want all of us to let this settle deep into our heart 
God through Paul says, there are some of you that are no longer spiritually alive because you have not taken the Lord's Supper as God has taught us to take it. We begin this month by talking about just what is worship. What does it mean together to pour out your adoration to God? And then we've spent some time looking at how the scriptures teaches us to worship, looking at each element or avenue of worship. And today, of course, we've looked at the Lord's Supper. And maybe it'd be easy to say, you know, it's a good study, but it's not really that big a deal. How big a deal is it? God says there's some that are not even spiritually alive because of the way they have profaned the taking of the Lord's Supper. I know it may be asking a lot to remember several weeks back in a sermon. But do you remember when we studied about what is worship? We talked about the fact that when we see God for who He is, we are then humbled and we see ourselves for who we are. We're reminded that we need a Savior and that, as Isaiah said, we are ruined. When we have that cleansing, it is great appreciation and our natural response is then, Lord, here I am, send me. What if instead of taking the Lord's Supper to see the Lord for who He is, what if instead, like they were doing, we take the Lord's Supper to be selfish? We take the Lord's Supper maybe in an apathetic way. They weren't serious about it at all. What if in taking the Lord's Supper, we never see God for who He is? I can sure feel good about myself when I look left to right. Because I can always find somebody that I look good compared to them. Then we don't appreciate atonement. And then we don't have a humble servant heart that says, Lord, here I am, send me. We become weak, we become sick, and we die. I really believe that the church isn't losing, if we are losing half of our young people, I don't believe we're losing them because they know how to worship. I don't believe we're losing new converts because they know how to worship. I believe we lose folks. I believe it's the world's gain whenever people either don't know how or they stop worshiping in spirit and in truth. Everything God asks of us in worship. It's wonderful that we can pour out our adoration to Him in song and in study and in prayer and in the contribution and in the communion. But as wonderful as that is that we can give that to God, it's a fact that we need it. It's what keeps us focused, stabilized, anchored, rooted, grounded, growing productive, fruitful. Tonight, please don't let this series pass without having a renewed conviction. I want to worship God for everything that He's offered. I don't want to miss any gift that He offers in worship because I've been apathetic. Let's give our all every time we come into this house to worship our God who is alive, who is powerful, mighty and true. According to this very same book in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, whenever those that do not know the Lord come into a place where God has truly been worshipped, they're convicted of their sins and they fall down and they cry out in worship that truly God is alive. Maybe tonight... You've come here and you know that your life is not right and, and you want to respond, not to us, you want to respond to God. We would love to assist you in any way that that could be done. If you need further study, you have more questions or if, if you have prayers, if, if you're ready to be immersed into Christ, if you need to be restored, whatever we can do, let's all give our all to the one who deserves our all. How blessed we are to have Christ as our Savior.